Thank you all for being here. We have two incredibly uh, great, wonderful poets reading for us today, uh, Dan Linehan and Doran Robbins. They are good enough to give us, uh, give us some of their work today. It's going to be just an amazing afternoon. And uh, so our first reader is going to be Dan Linehan. Dan is a longtime professional writer, author, and award-winning poet. Uh, he often interweaves nature, science, current events, and far-flung lands into his work. His poetry has been widely published in books, newspapers, and literary journals, including the anthology of Monterey Bay Poets. As a managing editor, he co-founded Ping Pong, and he's written two chapbooks. Uh, he's passionate about helping to solve environmental crises through creativity. Uh, he has this amazing multimedia serial novel, The Princess of the Bottom of the World, uh, which was inspired. He had a fellowship uh, in Argentina where he worked on this. Uh, and what he's created is really a tour de force. It's not just a book. Uh, it's a multimedia experience that has uh, a book in it, of course, in the experience. But it's accompanied by images and video and music. Uh, it's, um, it's, truly, uh, it's truly wonderful. Uh, his, you can get access to it uh, through his website, uh, which is uh, D-S-L-I-N-E-H-A-N, dslinehan.com, uh, and uh, there's a whole set of links, uh, and uh, those, uh, those will take you to um, what he's done. And I must say that the images, the photography uh, in um, what he's created is stunning. Uh, and Antarctica uh, and uh, that part of the world is, you know, is stunning, but it, it truly is an amazing experience. So without further ado, Dan, um, over to you. Dan will read for 20 to 25 minutes, and uh, we look forward to hearing, uh, hearing from you, Dan. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to just quickly share my screen here. So thank you guys very much for having me. And um, what I'll do is I'll read a few poems and I'll kind of talk a little bit about uh, the new work that I uh, recently published and how that connects to poetry and how that kind of connects to, um, I guess, a lot of the things we're facing, you know, gosh, we've been facing for, you know, almost four years, some tough stuff. And it kind of goes on a little bit further than four years, I guess, in some of this. So I'm going to first start out with an, with an older poem called Stranded. And I dusted this thing off because, you know, though this is kind of a few years old, this really seems to fit the time. And uh, this was first published by um, CSUMB, the, the university over in Monterey Bay, um, and it's called Stranded. I want to do so much, I don't know how to start. Right foot in quicksand, left foot in concrete, dropped into the East River. Both feet sink at different rates. When I was a child, I was taught, judge not, least ye be judged. Practice what you preach. Do unto others as you would like done unto you. I still believe this, where have I strayed? If everyone is killing in the name of God, then God must not want anyone to live. Everything cancels out, right? Stranded because so much around me does not make sense. It must be the wiring of my mind crossed. Many years after 1984, even Winston does not believe two plus two equals five, but I do. Only animals follow orders with blind obedience, but flags still do blindfold. Is it my memory is short? Has my brain exceeded its capacity? Has my gray matter learned it's better not to matter anymore? Deadened, numb, and stranded. My immunity from infection and disease is so embattled, I am desensitized to everything. The chemicals that pass for food, the chemicals that pass for air, the chemicals that pass for drink, all this in place of the bread and water prison promises to provide me. Stranded by individual wrappers, penis enlargements, and breast augmentation, refinance offers from telemarketers and junk mail credit card applications, stranded by the shifting definition of all natural, Stranded by 967 options and features when all I need are two. Stranded by record profits and underreported casualties. Stranded by history rewritten. Stranded by pussy grabbers. Stranded by this nightmare that I keep hoping to wake up from. 
Doesn't deterioration lead to disintegration? And all the king's ready-made fortifications and all the king's quick-drying reinforcements can only bolster one wall at the expense of the other three. There are always side effects. Have I become such a fixture that the propagation and spreading apart of cracks is now the only way for breath to enter my body? If I could at least topple over, wouldn't that be action? I might bounce once or twice or roll over on my back. If this is action, what is my reaction? Where is the despair if I can swim but not when the water level has risen? New islands will form, some will forever wash away, Outcasts become castaways. I will be stranded and alone, yet not alone. Anthrax in a letter, remember that? Friendly fire, collateral damage from a precision guided munition, a bullet from an assault rifle, a kick from a jackboot, a rock picked off the ground, burned on or by the cross. In the end, does it really matter the method of my murder? Can't warriors always find a reason to go to war? A year before Winston's re-education, the call sang, the walls came down. I don't think there are any Russians and there ain't no Yanks, just corporate criminals playing with tanks. A pebble can start an avalanche, but how can a pebble turn one around? On TV, a student can stop a column of tanks, but off camera, doesn't the truth lie with the student beneath Chinese grass? Prime time rewards the white collar crook, white beater junkie host with catchphrases and laugh tracks. Sleuths solve the most microscopic of crimes. Where have the nanometers left to run? Imagine revolution. Where is John right now? How disappointed he would be of me collecting dust while waiting for nothing but ashes and dirt to rise up and find a voice. I do not want to be stranded with my rage anymore. Why can't I find my fuse? Sparks from flint rocks tossed like dice. Bits of information trapped in splinters fall to the ground when the breeze stirs or after a good rubbing. Will they lose their names? Will they not become compost and forgotten? I watch the arms of a spiral galaxy through a telescope on a mountaintop. When the eyepiece frosted over, I blew through it to clear away the ice. And like a summertime dandelion, the arms disappeared into the wind. Is this all there is left to see? How many questions can you ask of the wind? I've never felt so deserted, so alone, so stranded. So that's my longest ever poem, thank God. <laughs> but I think it's in, a, in this time of social, of this isolation and stuff, it's really, it's really easy to become uh, man, you know, feeling so stranded. And uh, we have to remember that, you know, these are tough times and we can do stuff, we can fight back and, um, you know, we can um, come out of this hopefully stronger. Um, so anyway, that was stranded. Also another important thing happening uh, in, this, in this time is uh, a lot of the, um, the issues uh, that are being addressed with, with the um, Black Lives Matter and a lot of the social justice issues that are getting a lot better notice and um, but I wrote this uh, the day that Rosa Parks died. I was working for uh, Los Angeles Unified School District doing some consulting science work for them. And I was trying to do mass transit and having a very difficult, difficult time navigating the buses. And it was the same day again, Rosa Parks died. And this is one of my few rhyming poems. It's called Mass Transit. Rosa died, she died today. I lost myself, I lost my way. Riding with strangers on the bus, won't let me know what's the rush. All four corners, nice and round, all this talking with no sound. In each of us, there is this wheel, it spins around until we heal. The driver preaches, he's got words to say, I don't agree, he makes me stay. The stops keep gliding, by and by, I know not where, I know not why. Connections come, connections go, back and forth against the flow. Are we riding, killing time, or in search for some thin dime? I watch the water turn to rust. It grinds us all into dust. From the handrails, we can hang. Engines moan, tailpipes bang. But in my heart, I still have lust. Just can't find a route to trust. The trip is long, been on my feet. Just wish I could 
find a seat. So now I'm going to kind of get into the new work, um, the Prince of the Bottom of the World. And I think this is kind of an interesting thing. This is, a, this is the Larson B ice shelf and in some satellite images. And this is in 2002 when this breakup occurred. And this is around the time when I was making that transition from, from you know, engineering and science to become a writer. And so I was deeply involved in poetry and, and really building my craft at the time. And so it's kind of an interesting thing that this happened really at the same time. And this is really what got me clued into really how damaging the effects of climate change. Now, being that this is a, uh, a poetry event between um, both sides of Monterey Bay, Monterey and Santa Cruz, I put this, this little thick graphic up there. When the Larson B broke up, it was 1,255 square miles. That's six times larger than the Monterey Bay and it disintegrated in 35 days. Now this happened in 2002. Now we've been having this stuff happen constantly. And I think just in the news, just a couple days ago, uh, I think one of the last big ice shelves in, 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 um, in Canada, the Arctic Circle just collapsed. So anyway, I had to do something. And so I, I uh, eventually kind of got together an expedition to Antarctica to research um, these issues and to write about them. And so write about them in a science way, but also using poetry, the language of poetry to do some of this. And I saw climate change in action. You know, these are some of the photographs I took. These are some of the wildlife influences that I saw, the issues that we're facing. So what I did was instead of writing a, a, another big scientific type of thing to kind of just give to people who probably won't read it anyway because they believe it, I tried to do something that might connect to a larger audience to really reach out to be able to use the techniques of poetry and fiction and all these things to maybe kind of connect with people in a certain way. So I took this, I made this a novel, it's seven episodes, but I did something different too. I did also have these, this big giant vast treasure trove of photographs and videos and all these things. So what I, what I decided to do is put this companion to the novel where you can actually see things in a factual way, what the penguins were, ice shelves, all this stuff. So, I have this multimedia travel companion that's kind of linked to it. So for example, if you're reading along, you could see in the text, hey, you know what? I see these photographs. I'd like to see what this looks like. You click on it and it takes you to, you know, it's a free website, just like anything. And you can see the photographs and kind of every episode has got a list of all kinds of assets, multimedia assets. So, hey, what if I, there's a song you mentioned in, in, the, in the book. Well, what if you want to listen to it? Well, you can do that also. You can, you can look at the, you know, have Bob Dylan song on there, Modern English, U2, some other songs. Um, so you can check that out. And also video. So I've got some video clips in there. They're not the greatest quality because I wasn't, I wasn't there to actually shoot video, but still they're in really special places and they're in special times. So you can see some really wonderful videos, especially this is one of my favorites. So Stealing Rocks, if you guys get a chance to do that. But poetry, how does poetry relate into this? So you could see that, you know, in this particular case, to the two main characters of this, you know, they're both writers and they're both poets. And uh, I infuse this kind of dialogue into, into the book. And you can see here, you know, what do you write? Science and poetry. Do you think they're alike? Yes and no. Um, and so we'll get into some of the poems that are part of this book. This is called The Beagle Channel. And this is the opening scene of the whole novel. Sandra told me about her silver ring. Her mother said, silver has healing powers. I showed her my silver earring. I feel like a pirate now. She is a telescope back in Chile. This is her last cruise. She knows magic tricks. We watched a comet sharing a pair of binoculars. So this is a photograph and it actually isn't from uh, Antarctica. Uh, this is took, taken recently up in Yosemite, and this poem is called Trece Fuegos, which means 13 fires. And so uh, when I was flying around South America, I could obviously see smoke rising up from, from, the, from the land. It was pretty disturbing, but we have some severe su fire issues here as well that we're, that we're facing. Undeniably scientifically proven, they, there's a correlation between climate change, our, our you know, our rising temperature and the frequency and severity of fires. This is called Trece Fuegos. Billowy white clouds float below me and are flat on the bottom, but look like balls of cotton on the tops. 
Their shadows drift over patches of forest and jungle, but mostly over land beheaded. Between the shadows and these clouds, 13 trails of smoke rise. More, but I've stopped counting. So much open space between wispy pillars as wind slants smoke like hacked tree trunks in mid-fall. Windy howls cannot slow smoke reaching up to tangle with the clouds or fire reaching up from thin soil. So um, after I did my, my expedition to Antarctica, that was in 06 and 07. In 2013 and 14 is when I was a writer in residence in Argentina working on this novel. And when, it, when I was down there, actually the worst storm in the history of the city hit. It was like one of those 500 year storms and over 50 people died. This is the, the view outside my residency when the rain just started and this wasn't even the worst part of it. This is a three way intersection on a modern city. There's three actual roads merging at this one intersection and you don't see anything but a lake. And this is how it just started. So this is a poem called Over 15. Over 15 inches. 15.44 to be exact. 15 just to keep it round like a giant fat raindrop. Let me say it again. Over 15 inches of rain in less than one day. Why is this happening to us? We have nothing now. It all washes away, far, far away. Over 15 inches of rain equals over six feet in places where water swells higher than high. To immerse the heads of those without sturdy boxes and tables to climb upon, to overflow the sick and elderly trapped on the ground floor and pedestrians who cannot swim, to engulf the infants and children too young to be tallied in the toll, to float cars on rivery streets like hard plastic trash, to paint oil-stained watermarks as ghostly slick memories on houses, signposts, banners, up, up, and up. Why now the flood? Why against the season? Rain, it has never liked this before. Downstream of La Plata, the petroleum refinery shuts its floodgates to protect itself, allowing the water to rise, rise, rise. It says, fuck you to the people of the city. Don't you know we provide the jobs and we provide rain in inches over 15. So poetry is a great way to express some of these things that are pretty tough. Um, but let me get back now to some, um, some kind of the nicer things, because again, a whole book about just, you know, some devastating news is kind of is really, a, you know, not exactly the coolest thing. So you mix in a lot of stuff with just relationships and how, 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 the, how the characters are navigating these circumstances and you want to connect with them. So uh, an interesting thing in Ushuaia, when I was down there, I was down there for about, I don't know, less than, a, little, about a little bit less than a month. And this is the southern tip of, of, of Argentina where ships go to go to Antarctica. This is the back and forth place. And it was amazing because there's so many dogs and they were like citizens. They just kind of marched along, did their own thing. No one really cared. And they were just kind of so happy and kind of cool with everything. And so I thought that was a really interesting thing. And I don't normally write about, you know, dogs and, and these kind of things, but I did five poems because it was just kind of funny. So this is called Cats and Dogs. At the bottom of the world, dogs run free in the streets. They are happy because there are no cats in sight. So what was amazing is I didn't see any cats. So this poem was really kind of my, my you know, me trying to figure out why the dogs were so happy. But that wasn't the only thing, all right? So this is Dogs Are Happy. Little dogs run on the tips of their paws to carry large paper bags that dangle by the handles from their mouths. And big dogs chase after cars that pass. They like the taste of bumpers, fenders, and tires. So you could see this is, you could see the photograph there is where I gathered inspiration from this poem because that dog was actually biting at all the cars that went by and just kind of had a, a fun old time taking a chomp at every car that went by and that was about it. 
No one cared. I think that was his corner. This is the destination of dogs. Happy dogs shot past windows, even when the tables inside are ground level and spread with the food of diners. They are too busy with the day to be bothered. They are off to sleep in the doorsteps. And again, these are all based upon like observations. So this is dogs on bicycles. Sometimes the dogs are too happy to walk and run. When this happens, they ride their bicycles. If their legs are too short to touch the pedals, they ask little girls to do the pedaling. And then they let their tongues hang out to flap in the wind and taste the air. And then this is the last of the dog's poems, thank God. The happiest of all dogs are those that lay in the middle of the road, licking themselves hour after hour. They have the right of way. <laughs> Uh, so this is a poem, uh, Constellations, and um, I kind of put it together on the screen here, you know, kind of like a concrete poem, form poem. And um, so I have this both in English and Spanish, and so I'll read them both. This is a really quick poem. Constellations. I trace the freckles on your back, connecting the dots, and lose myself in the space between. Constellaciones. Trazo las pecas en tu espalda, uniendo los puntos, y me pierdo en el espacio entre ellos. Okay, and this is the last poem from the set of, of Bottom of the World right now. And it's called Get Busy Living. And it connected to some of that text that you saw previously that I showed. The title of this poem she chose, but did not want to bleed for me. She said to me, my eyes look like ice crystals in glacier water. I love her for saying this. She is the tormented poet, not I. And I insisted her eyes were brown. She loves Jasmine because she remembers her abuela during Christmas in summertime. She hates packaged roses and packaged flowers. I promise to pick her something else from the waterfront to have waiting if she ever returns. So those are the, that's kind of a, a set of the poems connected to the book. As you can see, there's, there's a few ways to kind of get the book and I wanna encourage you guys to download it and feel free, I know it's the economics are a difficult time, there's a, a coupon there, get it for free. If you've got it before but haven't updated it, it's now fully integrated, so it's still good to kind of get the latest version. And then I put a link, I put the links in the comments. So if you want to copy those really quickly, you can do that. That might be the easiest way. Again, you know, please take a look at this stuff. The multimedia travel companion is totally free, so you just can plop on that like a normal website. And then what I'll do now is I'm going to read a couple poems from Monterey. So this is Stargazer. I hope some of you guys got a chance to see the Neowise comet out there. The, uh, I guess the Perseid meteor shower is, is starting up, is going to be, is started already and it's going to be really pretty busy. So next few days will be when the best time to see the, the meteor shower. And so this is taken at Fremont Peak. So a lot of you guys are local. So that big mountain in the top that you see all the way when you're looking towards Salinas, I had to, I couldn't, I couldn't see anything because of the marine layer. And so what you see there is the sun, the sun setting right above the marine layer and you see the moon in there. Unfortunately, the comet was too small to pick up on a photograph like this, but you can see my, the spotting, the telescope I had. And so this was just the other day trying to look at the, um, the Neowise comet. And this is Stargazer. This poem is set in Asilomar, the beach in, in Monterey. Cold sky and patchy clouds illuminated by the unseen moon. A sea breeze strokes the shore. Midnight nears, celestial fireworks peak soon. So much openness, I cannot see it all. Fast moving tendrils of wind spiral up 
my pants and jacket, smacking me with wet fingers. I wear a scarf, but I never wear a scarf. My hands pressed into the furthest recesses of my pockets, groping for warmth, resting on driftwood, now a sandblasted log. I swivel my head all around. I know when I look ahead, drizzles of starlight drop behind me. When I look back, drizzles of starlight fall in front of me. I blink and they are gone, look up and they are gone, look down and they are gone. Waiting for the magic, wishing for a wishing star. Rain falls on my face. I thirst to lick this cosmic dew. I want to be out there everywhere, scattered among the stars, to twinkle down, twinkle down from uncharted and forbidden planets. Stellar is my field of view, clusters, nebulas, galaxies. In search of searches, I watch the stars wink at me, encouraging me along, but their lifetimes and my lifetime are immeasurably different. Looking past the Silomar to the ocean, it's streaked toward Point Joe, a laser pulse. How many have I missed by looking in the wrong direction? The white fluorescence of the waves breaking ashore, the smell of cold sea through my numb nose. Clouds sweep past the stars, masking, blinking. My eyes are drawn to that. Trickery, earth fights to keep me rooted. Must I return to the ground? I know how much space is in space, how much coldness, how much emptiness and vacuum. But oh, how I long to be with the stars. They look so full, enormous and warm. They look so happy, like speckles of rejoice and jubilation. I'll, uh, I'll close off with this one. And this is I Sail For You. And this is in, in uh, Buenos Aires. And that is the Uruguay, one of the ships that helped rescue people from Antarctica. And the bridge behind there is the woman's bridge, which is designed to look like a sail. I sail for you. Cross seas of blue, longing blue. Through the depths I must learn in the endless of your eyes. Steer my voyage with a pressure that only comes from the soul of heat. A wash in the want of currents, lured to a course uncharted, where I lose myself in the promises told by each strand and curl of your falling hair. Sails are sheets of painted breaststrokes raised high and wide to pull my breath away and hold it, squeezed and squeeze, squeezing oh so tight. Words from you breathe lulls into whispers in flight across my wind, journey of your lips, liquid they fill. My insides are waves ever flowing against backdrops of disappearing horizons, red with marbled clouds. Lantern is yours, mast is mine, signal from over the curvature of ocean as my touch too to trembling draws near. Murmurs smolder from higher than lookout heights, hook this wayward wanderer on a lighthouse song. In the sweet tasting salt of weeping fog, drape of shores, drip of coastline, breeze stirs in the nighttime, lift past its vows, harbor and wait, Windswept arches arise, the small of your simmering back, pulsations of wind dewed flowers. I arrive, I arrive, furl and tie down, empty my holds, wakes vanish in the ebb and flow, tug between my moon and your oceans. I arrive, distance, distance, no more. Thank you all very much. That's it. Thank you, Dan. That was wonderful. It was a real, uh, it was a real journey. And, um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but thinking in, in your first poem, um, Stranded, uh, you know, the, it was remarkably prescient of you since you wrote it a while ago. Uh, and I thought there could be um, a connection to the current, recently current uh, experience of the brown shirts uh, in Portland mm. um, showing up and stranding uh, people yeah. there. Uh, I think every time I read it, something else disturbing pops out. And I wrote that actually during the uh, the regime of Bush, you know. So and um, yeah. the only thing, the only change I I I made to that poem is probably you know the 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 the, the reference to pussy grabber, um, which unfortunately is is something that that uh, yeah unbelievable. And uh, the trying to wake up from the nightmare, <laughs> yeah. which I keep trying to hope 
hopefully I will wake up from. <laughs> well, we need to keep the faith, and I think we will. Uh, we will wake up. Um, this will pass, but not not easily and not without cost uh, and effort. Uh, it's 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 not just going to go away. Thank you, uh, and folks, if you if you didn't notice it, Dan has posted the URLs for you to uh, connect to uh, what he's created. Uh, and it's what was on the screen earlier uh, when he showed you the links uh, to, uh, to his, uh, the whole set of things, including his website. So thank you again, Dan, and uh, appreciate it. And now we'll turn to another outstanding poet, uh, Doran Robbins, uh, who uh, is uh, uh, Professor Emeritus at uh, Foothill College in creative writing, uh, where uh, he taught for a number of years. Uh, he is a poet, a mixed media artist, and a literary critic. Um, Doran's work has appeared in many publications, including the American Poetry Review, Angry Old Man, Another Chicago Magazine, Exquisite Corpse, Autolith, Sulphur, and the Iowa Review. Uh, his books have been awarded the Blue Lynx Poetry Award in 2001 and the 2008 Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Poetry Award. And this year, Spite and Dival Press published his monograph, Apocalypse Commentary, on Sharon Dubiago's book, Naked to the Earth. So he's a busy man. Um, and High Moon Books published Not Fade Away Poetic Prose Monologues, Three Sequences. Will we hear? some of what's in these books uh, today, Doran? Yeah. Uh, I won't be reading from this book uh, because it's, it's critical and it's uh, Apocalypse Contemporary and it's, uh, it's just a study on Sharon Dubiago's most recent book of poems, Naked to the Earth. Uh, and that's from Sport and Doyle. The book's available on Amazon or through them or you could write to me at my website. But I'll be reading from this book um, Not Fade Away, which is a book of uh, poetic prose monologues in three sequences. Doran, great to have you with us. Over to you. Okay, great to be here. You know, uh, other poets I talk to, they kind of discredit, you know, wanting to uh, read on Zoom, um, you know, obviously for reasons of not being, uh, you know, in a live performative context with a live audience and I said, well, you know, we spend so much time alone anyways, you know, uh, and there's plenty of reciprocity when we're reading, listening to music or, you know, doing whatever it is that we do. So why not do it on the screen? We're all used to the screen anyways. Um, one thing about uh, Not Fade Away, I know that it's um, probably, uh, you know, easier to think of the book in terms of the song that a Buddy Holly wrote back in the late 1950s and that the Stones in particular did a fantastic version of. But um, the title actually, and coincidentally, comes from a uh, passage in a long uh, uh, medieval Irish poem called Sweeney Astray, translated by Seamus Haney into contemporary English. And there's a passage in the poem where the poet says, you crowd my head and fade away and leave me to the night. Um, the whole poem is, is a really unusual exploration of uh, personal transformation. And um, I just wanted to isolate that, you know, in terms of so much as we grow older uh, fades away. And there's a kind of a um, absurd uh, plea in the title to not fade away, which for me is really my memories and my poems. Um, by way of dedication to, to this reading, and I absolutely want to make one, I was, I was looking at an interview that Lawrence Spurningetti gave a few years ago uh, when he was on television, and the uh, interviewer asked him how it felt to be on mainstream media. Uh, it's not often that poets get a chance to be in mainstream media. Uh, and he had kind of a condescending tone, or I don't know, condescension might have been... Um, simply organic to his nature, but Ferlinghetti responded by saying, well, I think you're the dominant media, the dominant culture, but you're not the mainstream media. The mainstream media is still the high culture of intellectuals, 
writers, readers, editors, librarians, professors, artists, art critics, poets, novelists, and people who think. They are the mainstream media and the mainstream culture. So I'm dedicating this reading to the mainstream culture and to Lawrence Sverlinghetti and his 101st year of poetry, art, and a high degree of political sanity. Um, thinking of political sanity, I mean, words aren't usually put together in a, in, in a way that is not an oxymoron. I'm gonna begin with a piece um, that, you know, kind of conveys my elegiac and disgusted feelings about what's going on, not just since Trump, but probably since Reagan, although it focuses a little bit on the current regime. Most of these pieces are, are without title because they're in, in longer sequences. So as they need titles, I'll probably give you one. And if not, I'm just going to shoot straight ahead like right now. The new Trump goes against the alphabet. His spokesperson accused metaphors of being false or misleading numbers. The proportionate dimensions are subjective of all the septicity, instilled septicity carried over after Obama, after Bush, after their support of Spawn, after, after the tribe that bathes in the toilet water of Cain or culture. Maybe Pompeii will return, worth its weight in aneurysms. Not a Paris commune by the dozens will turn to some end to end it. You can wish them all the agitilia, scrotumitis, chronic enlarged foreskin, regrowths, numb clit, and dermo attrition all you like. They'll never cop. They've no reason to give you or any inclination to inform you what the actual etymology means and the configured definition behind Gitmo and the rest of their Guantanamologies. They weren't just standing around storing it up on the side, waiting for the big moment, you know. The ongoing seed and feedism to the point of design, the repetition instinct in the first place, the tying a dog to a tree in the yard and never returning syndrome. I don't know what I would do to them if it were up to me, the mercy or more pain conundrum. Whatever I would do wouldn't be the only schmucky thing I've done or held back from doing. Isn't there one schmuck that discovered how to get out of this drain already? And the drain is longer. You can't determine the passage in the drain. The drain ignores you, your short paycheck, job, no job, skin pigment, genital design, gender infatuation, you, your two dead fetuses, the rope at the end of the tunnel, the ham in your hand, and the hand you do your business with. They weren't picking up their socks and putting on their feet, you know. They weren't just squeezing their whistles, calculating the payoff deadline. They came in a wave, including on numbers of screens, in a crowd, toward the crowd, the target, the bystanders' plowable union, including with rampaging hordes and overalls. They were expressing their grievances in their business suits, get up and with white torches, with white sheets and reusable ass hats, with cut up, cut you up expressions descended from the great gnat clan. There's no scientific consensus on what constitutes a gnat. They're described flying in large numbers, themselves described as clouds. What is the total count in the phrase flying in large numbers or rampaging hordes? What is the total count for Otto Schubert's ink drawing, The Suffering of Horses in the War, 1919? What happened at the front of the customer service line, referred to in an interview? What stared down the title of Teddy Plentikoff's painting at the counter with amputations, 203 to 219? So this uh, segues into a, um, another piece that um, 
well, anyone who's over 65 might have started uh, experiencing how the body misbehaves. And sometimes there are feelings of uh, frustration regarding uh, how the body betrayed, uh, betrays us and absurdly how the mind, our emotions, our memories do the same. So uh, there's a friend that I wanted to see from high school from many years ago, and I still haven't seen, but he visited me in a dream. And a fellow by the name of Yorios, which is uh, Greek for George, also appears in this kind of a dream vision. My eyes grew worse. How did I get to the north window? Unfigure outable, sudden disequilibrium, accurate focus, perspective diminishment. How can my eyes be that complicatedly, enigmatically wasting away into flax marbles in my head without sound, any form of sound? More than anything, I rely on sound. With enough sound, I would have known what's happening. I heard it before, a kind of radar jingle. I might have sensed things worse than I heard about in the first iPhone jukebox, Sphinx voice warning in my head with some sound going on. Oh, just flow with it, she said. Maybe, I said, maybe if I wasn't still tied to the ground by a strand of hair in that part of myself, I said. It's a frustration thing more than a retaliation occurrence, trying to figure out where it started. Try naming that. The rhythm in a drawer of mud is your archetype, your frustration agonistes. Better smell the water, smell everything with the kind of eyesight I have. I don't. Am I more casual or less neurotic for not doing it? I'm not casual. I don't trust casual. Then the one friend from when I was 16 to 19, I wanted to reconnect with for several years, visits me in a dream. He's a cannibal, he says, and he nods. He's come to eat me. I'll be analyzing for years why this dream was inevitable, why it was followed by a sequence led by the puppet's muse and the dissection of the fold in her brain to locate the cocoon morphology gene. In the other passage, Yorios, someone named Yorios, followed me, followed the puppet's muse. I went out to meet him. People I trust insisted, at sandals, he's the best. He showed me a sample gold sandal. There was no leather. There couldn't be any way I'd listen to a sales pitch for sandals from this man, this Yorios. He sensed it. Okay, but the calluses must come off. Yes, I said with a foot in his hand that wasn't at first my foot, but a foot that would work with the sample of gold sandals. He cut off the calluses with a sharp knife. I knew this could be done by the right technique. I was queasy in the head and both feet. Wait, he said, partying and coming back through split leather curtains, handing me a paper bag and a pitcher. Here are your sandals. If they don't fit, you'll grow into them or next to them. I put the money in his hand. I smoked my Karelia. I took a swig of village wine from the pitcher. That wine always erased the stone in my throat, that ongoing stone, that trickster's gold sandal, that yorios in a part of the mind where such things take hold. So um, that's from the first section of the uh, three sequences, recordation. This piece uh, is in the uh, middle section, and uh, it's from Apologization is the title of that section. And, you know, the title is derived from a series of uh, ongoing uh, transitions uh, and apostrophes that always Positive a kind of apology. I'm sorry, forgive me. And of course, I go into something ironic and vulgar or something like that. So it's kind of a mock apology. In this particular one, uh, I was thinking about what I call the metal feeling. Forgive me, right off. Excuse all esoteric faults. You ever get the metal feeling? I heard a way out cardinal singing, putting down a signal. My whole torso was a metal shudder. 
you ever get the scorpion dream and the cardinal is in it and the cardinal can't get off the ground, the wings are something, the weight are something, the mental lifting, the chest armor pulling it down, the defective instinct or something. You're suffocating in a blue beak and the scorpion comes out for you, cardinal on the ground. We're made of that too. More the kind of cardinal than it's saying to be. The kind of cardinal who can't sing serenades inside a nest. The type that comes down to the ground to sing. And scorpions listen for that voice. That's the kind of music they listen for. Then they snap you. I had the metal feeling. Forgive me, the debt you get is the debt you need it to be. You add it up and take it out. You do it, you stop doing it. You do it again, you do it over again. You write it down, you forget to do it. You don't do it enough, you tally everything. You can't find anyone else to do it. You make up and thrust out your notes, cardinal on the ground. You put on metal. You don't know what you're wearing. You break what protects you. It's practical to you. You're mixture. You're something to remember things by. What things to remember with metal, without metal, the way you do the things you do? You ever get the wrong direction in the wrong place at the wrong time, in the wrong city, at the wrong apartment, in the wrong mindset, in the only way possible and no way? No way around it, because those were your cards, your outside forces, your aversion to forces, your habits, your mumbly peg, your 47 jobs myth. Forgive me, I'm talking about Tasmania, the sense for caution, the Tasmanian devil eating scorpions live, hunts for scorpions. Scorpions are their delicacy. Along the way, on the way out, there are delicacies. Those Tasmanians were my totem. What they eat, when they eat it, the delicacy you need to absorb until you're out of the wrong side, the wrong step, in the wrong Tasmania. What the hell was I doing in Tasmania? Wiping glass on the wrong side of the window. Birds, scorpions, Devils that aren't monsters, the storm that waters language and the cracked parts of the body, your head a blur of repeated images, and you get the metal feeling. You get depression's upside down wing. As far as Tasmania, what it took for a while, what the rhythm gives back to you, what it's already ready to unleash again, in case you think you can joke around when you come out of it. Um, now, I gotta read this one here. I wasn't gonna read it, but you know, I've lost a lot of people. I mean, it's, it's a familiar, obviously common experience, the older you get. And um, one of the things that is, uh, hit me with the impressions is the uh, the quality of the face um there, there's something in the quality of the face that, that 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 never leaves it's it's the essential character of the person that uh i always felt was transmitted to me you know and i think it's different for every person i mean you could have seven brothers and sisters and they're all they all talk about your parents in a different way um, it's the same way with the friends and lovers, too. So anyways, I was thinking about the quality of face in this passage. I'm still in apologization here. Wait, forgive me. The face I'm thinking about, that face has a face you could say meant to be touched face, where the mouth is part pounded in part and has the bus driver's face pulling away winding out the gear and the release it strains along with your what you don't know what that face that what images convulse i saw an accordion player in 1954 downtown los angeles with that face someone less than my size his monkey with the equivalent accordion player monkey man face played a jew's harp 
held a money cup between his knees. The fur was darker on the left one where the red ribbon tied. The face I'm seeing, I'm thinking that face has a face that had to do with and knew after it happened partially what to do with the tight lips in that face that wants to be the embittered or blackmailed saga of that part of a face. Of all the practical jokes, may I die dried up in the wrong places. Let my beard shave itself in my sleep if I don't celebrate the fingers of a Romanian gypsy I saw in the slums of Athens playing a violin with one string. It looked like a panel router went over what was under that face, that anti-Euro face of all the recurring massacres of every incidental introduction, documented, undocumented, complete world history textbook circumstance. You don't have to rely on Vegas deciding where to place those bits. That face is prescient in one eye. Wherever they try to do it, they'll never relax the prescience unnoticed in the other eye or the defying terminal prescient conviction. The story goes, in the underworld, it isn't always night. Sometimes there are stars. Sometimes the stars look depressed. The eyelashes still look a little sanguine in decomposition. I know that face. I lost that face. It's a kind of out of it, intrepid memory of a face. I touch that immature face. I don't think about that face with ease. Not that young of a face. I'll close with this one here then. This is about a, uh, uh, still in Greece, thinking about this. I went through a lot when I traveled in Greece the few times I've been there. And um, this is about a passage that I uh, had to make if I was going to make it. And this is in, again in the third section now. I'm in Dilapidator, which has a lot of connotations, I know, but uh, time is short, so I'll just go into the piece. The returning ship, the backward screen, and how many times have I really been on dry land? Started out from Port Angeles. Whole destinies of patterns are connected to that time. Medium length, unsteady, various periods of almost marriages connected to that time. From the port, the sea is porcelain, mute. Is all porcelain mute or is there a porcelain cord we're incapable of comprehending? If there are no chords, what are, why must there be? What does it fulfill the demands to be mute? He ended up on the overnight ship from Ancona to Crete. He was in one of those, you're about to lose everything or still have everything to lose moments. The constant 1977 image, a ship from the Ionian line, the flying fish, more on the flying fish than the Ionian side of things, outside the heavy water and the heavily mended net, below the flexed fish wing, the whole telescopia on the overnight sky, the winter parts, the other ship behind the Pleiades, the star animal, possibly a bull, possibly pawing a hunter's belt, possibly. He had that raw under a heap feeling. The whole ensnarement, unedited is what I mean. The contradictory impulse, the contradictory impulse that fails, the daydreaming realism paradox, the psychological rule. You have to stand over yourself with a whip if you want to get through. Then stand over yourself with a whip for having agreed to do it. Oh, I was redefining him. I was looking at the man who taught him what he knew till he was 17, giving him a thousand dollar bill in the third to last dream, the intermission part. 
I could still make out the familiar thick fingers. There were starving monkeys with human faces in the city he returned to. No coincidence, welcome and welcomer. He fed them. He broke a spoon digging out something frozen and sweet from the bottom of a container. The next layer down, he lifted out the last of it. Everything held in the broken bowl of a spoon he found wrapped in a tide of his mind. The direction, part four of the same thing. Enough of it, how things stand. You eat your soup with a stone in the middle of it. You can't eat around the stone. The stone goes down with everything else. The rule is no exceptions. You have to redefine him. You have to rethink everything that brought you to the 1977 until now, giving you the whirlies conclusion about him. I had to stop eating when I thought about him. I put down my whip. I set the fish stew aside. He was mostly the fish tail, the skeletal part, the fish tail fan. I ate one of his fish eyeballs. It was a kind of surveillance. Not all of the garbage of humans is visible. You need that eye inside of you. You need all the evidence you can get. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Doran. Not fade away. Thank you. Wow. Um, <laughs> this has been quite an afternoon. And uh, thank you both for sharing the energy and the good work that you're doing. Uh, it's, nice, it's nice to get out and away from, from what's going on around and to, uh, to connect the way we've done. Uh, Indeed. I was intrigued, Doran, by your phrase, the quality of the face. Um, I, it reminded me, I, I, was going, I went to a college reunion of mine, and I was late, and it was in some hotel ballroom, and I got in there, and I thought, oh, crap, I'm in the wrong place. There are all these old people here. Um, <laughs> and then I looked, and I saw in the faces, the eyes, the qualities of the faces of the people there, and I realized, oh, no these are my classmates yeah. uh, because the qualities, yeah, the qualities of the face that I knew from, God, 20 or 30 years earlier uh, was still there. And uh, it's a neat concept. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think it's common though. You know, I think we just don't recognize it or remember it or, you know, it's hard to stay tuned all the yeah. time. Yeah, it is. And uh, I think it gets harder, too, with the sort of the stuff that goes on or is going on now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a little, it takes more work to stay focused. But I think, I think it, we can. It just takes, takes effort and it takes things like this getting together. And thank you both so much. Uh, we will do this again in a month uh, on September 13. Uh, and I can pretty much guarantee you that it's going to be via Zoom. Uh, and um, our poets will be uh, Maria Touche and um, Danusha Lameris. Uh, and uh, you, you may know them, they're both wonderful poets. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, please uh, check us out on Facebook, Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're not signed up, please sign up if you'd like. And uh, stay in touch. And thank you so much for being with us.